Okay, so um, I just want to give you first a brief background on myself. So I think it's kind of important to say, first of all, that this is, it is very, very much a basic approach to literature pedagogy. I'm a brand new professor at Wheaton College. I'm actually just finishing up my second year at Wheaton College. And so when I wasn't working with Jenny, it wasn't because I was somehow amazing with maps. It was born out of complete ignorance that we had a Jenny at all at Wheaton College. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to start off by saying that this was for me kind of an active learning experience, a bunch of experimentation, a couple of things that happened um, back to back that kind of threw me into the middle of mapping when I had just, I really was unfamiliar with these tools before going into this teaching situation. Um, so this is to say in a very short space of time last year, I found myself in the midst of two literary mapping projects. One was a one and a half month um, summer independent study with a student that was followed then in the fall, fall 2015, with an intro course to the digital humanities and Victorian literature in which um, I kind of made perhaps the rash decision to only spend two class periods um, on mapping tools. So hence the one shot mapping because we had only one shot to get it right. Um, so this is what I'm going to be talking about is the relationship, my experiences doing this one shot mapping and sustained mapping um, over the course of a course and also the independent study, but also to talk a little bit about how these two things ended up working with each other, the independent study and the course, and perhaps how we can bring together these two different types of teaching with our students and make them work in conjunction. I'm not going to say I was successful doing it this time around, but it's lessons that I've learned in doing this sort of work. Um, so in this talk then, this is how I'm structuring it, I'm going to explain the context of these two pedagogical settings. I'm going to then turn to my objectives, my lesson plan, my outcomes for my one-shot mapping experiment before then turning to sustained mapping. And finally, I'm going to end with a very pretty, I hope a very climactic slide of my pros and cons and takeaways from doing this work this past semester and over the summer. Okay, so next slide. Great, so um, the independent study. Basically, after my first year at Wheaton College, I was unexpectedly asked by a student to help him pursue a research project on Joseph Conrad. Um, he, however, was not interested, he said, in writing a research paper. Instead, he was more interested in figuring out the degree to which Conrad had fictionalized the journey and events in the Heart of Darkness. So I was, of course, very, very thrilled that he had taken Heart of Darkness, which we had read in a course in my first semester at Wheaton, and he had decided to run with us. Um, but I was also running into a problem, which was that I was getting married over the summer, and so was in Oregon, and so was planning a wedding and would not actually physically be at Wheaton College to guide this research. Um, so basically, when I, I agreed to help him out with this, with the caveat that he was going to have to take on a lot himself. Um, so he found, he taught himself the program ArcGIS. This is my first encounter with this program, was actually through the student, through student initiative. Um, and it culminated in a complete map of locations mentioned or even implied in Heart of Darkness and Conrad's Congo Diary. Um, additionally, too, I asked the student, since he was enrolled in my digital humanities course in the fall, I asked him to develop a one-hour lesson plan to teach this mapping tool and to present his research to my course. Um, so this was roughly how we structured the independent study, and I'll talk a little bit more later about how Google Docs ended up playing a really key role in all of this. As for the course itself, um, I am, the course was, a, the course was really fun, actually. It was an experimental course, which I ran for the very, very first time. Um, it was kind of my wish list, a, a crazy course I could develop. And ostensibly, while this was a digital humanities course, that's giving me an excuse to play around with tools I've been wanting to play around with for a while, it was really focused. I wanted the primary question to be on the role of literary criticism, this really pressing question, I think, for English majors in the 21st century. So I had, these were the questions I wanted them to really think about. What is the point of doing literary criticism? What should lit literary scholarship do? How should English majors structure their own education? So I, I think it really made sense, right, for this to be a Victorian's course, because 19th century thinkers themselves, from Williams Wordsworth to Matthew Arnold, 
John Stuart Mill to Oscar Wilde, they obsessed over this question about the relationship between literature and criticism and scholarship. So it, this really made sense, right? It, it was a course about taking charge of your own education. Why are you an English major? What do you think literary criticism should do? So that way, the tech skills were placed in the larger context of more theoretical and I think overtly political um, questions about the social uses of education and the study of English with particular focus on the intellectual history of literary criticism. So the digital tools then became important to the extent that they showed students that technology and computational thinking were changing the ways we were doing literary criticism. It was actually changing the political stakes of what we were doing. So mapping to me was a very important part of this course, but I didn't want it to dominate over all these other topics and ideas and themes I wanted to explore here. So including the politics of criticism, close reading versus distant reading, indexing and visualization, infographics and information artistry, and the data database itself as a narrative form. So I, so thus perhaps a very cramped syllabus that only was able to spend two courses on, on mapping. Um, but these are just a few. We were able to be pretty mobile though, because I only had seven students enroll. Um, and these are, this is kind of a short assortment of tools that we used in the class. So, okay, so next slide. One shot mapping. Um, this was my, this was my term. I can also talk a little bit more about why I chose this term. Domingo and I had a really interesting conversation about it this morning. Um, but this is my term um, to talk about, um, to introduce students to LTAs, low threshold applications for mapping within only two class periods. Um, and my idea behind using these really low threshold applications was to, I, I think that it was in, let me see, I think that it was in the Hamilton College, Asha and James's presentation yesterday where they said that process sometimes got in the way of the critical questions. And I was hyper aware because of the independent study, which I'll get to in a second, um, that, that this was a danger that we, we ran with these tools. They're so tempting to kind of fiddle with, but I wanted to make sure that we kept our focus on the critical questions. So hence really, really easy mapping tools. Um, the objectives in the mapping, skills-wise, I wanted to introduce them to two digital tools for telling stories and analyzing text. Conceptually, I wanted them to kind of really think through Franco Moretti's suggestion that thinking spatially about text, thinking geographically about text, brings to light hidden patterns that we might not otherwise see. Um, but broadly, too, I wanted them to assess, you know, if at all, that these digital tools, these digital mapping tools, challenge or modify literary criticism. So. Um, that was kind of my idea then for this mapping component. So I'll move quickly to the two tools we used, which was Story Map JS and History Pin. The only thing that I want to, I'm going to assume that I'm talking to an audience who is familiar with all of these tools, with both these tools. Is that fair? Oh, okay. No. Great. Right. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so I, okay, great. I, I will talk, which is what teachers love to do best. Um, so Story Map is this, it's this lovely tool that was um, actually released by Night Labs out of Northwestern University, and it's meant for it to be a journalism tool, but it's a great part of timeline slash geography tool that um, helps people tell stories on the web that highlight the locations of a series of events. So basically what you do, you plug in a bunch of different pins and you move through a map, you can kind of see Sahara Desert is in the middle of this map here. Um, you can kind of move through sequentially on the map and it's extremely easy to use. It's, it's almost like using PowerPoint, um, where except then as soon as you're done, they wrap everything up onto this map. It's very, very nice. Um, it's extremely aesthetically appealing. The students loved it. I think part of the problem though is, is that, um, or part of my hesitation with it is, is that students tended to do what, how they tended to use it in the way that they read a text, which is, is that they look for the causal chronological sequence, right? The way that the character moves through events. Um, and so they're, they're, what they wanted to do was they wanted to follow a character from point A to point B to point C, which is, kind of how we read plot anyway, right? So it kind of ends up reinforcing the ways that students already read. 
it's totally fine. I'll show you a project that did great work with this actually later on. But I also wanted another tool that would give, get them outside of that mindset. And History Pin was that tool. Um, this is a digital gallery and map that provides a means for creating an open crowdsource archive of images, sound files, text around a place, neighborhood, or location. The students said that it was not aesthetically appealing. They really didn't like how it looked after using StoryMap.js, but um, I, I think it's pretty, but I don't know. Students didn't like it. But the nice thing about it is, is that it doesn't actually force you to follow a timeline in the way that StoryMap.js does. It's just simply a collection of pins that you put on a map. So you kind of can end up getting outside of that causal chronological sequence of narrative. Also, too, on StoryMap.js, you can only use one computer at a time to work on this. So students would have to cluster around a single computer to enter all the pins. You cannot open up a project to a bunch of users at the same time. You can do that with History Pin. So History Pin for me was easier to use in a class setting because I could get all students to open their laptops, get on their computers, and just go for it at the same time. So those are the two tools we were using. Here's how I organized the class, because, um, and this was insane. I should not have spent only two <laughs> class periods doing this. But this is what I did. Prior to the class period, um, I had students, let's see. Prior to the class period, I had students read Heart of Darkness, of course, but I also had them read Franco Moretti's maps from graphs, maps, and trees to consider the suggestion that a literary map offers a model of the narrative universe which rearranges its components in a non-trivial way and may bring some hidden patterns to the surface. So I had students then kind of think about Moretti's claims, talk about maps and how he kind of uses maps in a very interesting way. And then um, at home, they I should also say that my WordPress blog was a really crucial, or I should blogspot blog was a really crucial component of this class. This is how we did all of our communication outside of class. Um, so students use their Wheaton email. I told them how to sign up for StoryMap.js and History Pin accounts. I also told them they had to email me their username for History Pin so that I could get a collection set up that I could then add them all onto. So you can see here, I started adding all of them to, as managers as soon as they emailed me their usernames. Um, and then I just told them to screw around, really. Um, Stephen Ramsey talks about the hermeneutics of screwing around, and this is something that I exposed my students to really early and told them, like, there is real virtue in just screwing around with these tools. So that's what they did. During the class period, then, I had all students bring their laptops to class. They can also borrow them from the library if they don't have their own. I kind of gave them the background of each of these programs. History Pen is actually a nonprofit organization. It's not from a university. Um, Obviously, uh, StoryMap.js is from Northwestern. Students then worked in a group with partners for 45 minutes on an application of their choice, because I wanted them to keep playing, to map locations they had recorded while reading Heart of Darkness. And so we basically had an in-class lab. And with only seven students, I was able to work with each group for about 15 minutes, just one-on-one. -on -one. And that's, that's basically how I structured my class. OK. so. After class, we ran out of time very quickly. Um, students continued the work on their maps following guidelines that I then posted on the course blog, which you can, oh, it's in a previous slide. But I had them do these following steps, most importantly, having them write a brief reflection on this work, what it taught them, what they were taking away from it. Um, and in the next class, this is the second class period, we just basically continued this work and we had a discussion about our reflections. I think a lot of the students um, said, well, is it okay that we didn't do what Franco Moretti does? And I was like, yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> um, I would say that the outcomes ultimately were mixed because I ran this um, exercise in November. Um, students told me they didn't really have time to put work into this assignment because they had midterm assignments, they had so much other stuff, they were kind of overstimulated by the prospect of Thanksgiving break coming up really soon. Um, so that was part of the problem. Also, part of darkness itself was a very, very difficult text that turns out to find mappable locations. And um, Conrad actually does not mention a lot of places by name, so you really have to kind of triangulate to figure out where, where he's talking about. Um, so this was. They talked about how tough that was, how they needed more time to do research. They just didn't have the time to do the research. 
and yeah, it should be obvious, but that this would be a problem. But it was, um, yeah, it was very tough. Isn't that better for hard lessons? <laughs> yes, <laughs> and I actually we did find something really interesting. I'll show you in the next slide that. Um, Oh, sorry about that. I'm going to go way over time. I'm going to go through this really quickly now. So History Pit, deeply unpopular because it broke, actually, in the middle of, of us using it. Um, the students' pins just disappeared. It was not our fault. It was History Pin's fault. And the tech, um, the tech people took 24 hours to fix the pins. Um, and, um, but there were some interesting patterns that actually emerged, even as perfunctory as this work was. So group two, notice that while there weren't many mappable locations in part two of the text, they actually discovered that they were able to map locations that were mentioned in passing or only metaphorically, which is really fascinating, right? So whenever a place is mentioned like in a metaphor or just like, you know, or when Marlowe's saying like, in my childhood I went to, he's actually really geographically specific, which is not how he talks about where he actually is. When he's talking about where he actually is, he never mentions a place by name. But when he's talking about, like, it was as dry as the Sahara Desert, there's a geographical specificity there. That was really interesting. So um, the next slide, I'll try and go really quickly. Um, I would say outcome number two was that there was kind of a long-term interest that was built into this. I had a student final project who said that when she was talking about her tech skills, she said, I know how to use Microsoft Word. That was the extent of her, and I know how to use the internet. Um, but that was the extent of her tech skills, so she was really nervous to tackle a final project on her own. But she ended up using StoryMap.js for a final project, analyzing Jane Eyre. And she was able to find, I think that this is really absolutely fascinating, by using StoryMap.js in conjunction with Google Maps and also um, together with just doing tons and tons of research on the Brontes and on the novel itself, she was able to see that um, that the geography of the novel, which is fictional, right? None of the places in Jane Eyre are in fact real, but it does in fact correspond with the actual geography of Yorkshire. And she found that the novel, um, like that we that Jane actually travels because the places in the novel can graft onto Yorkshire. Jane ends up traveling over 400 miles in the, over the course of the novel, which is bizarre for a novel that literally starts with the first sentence, there was no possibility of taking a walk that day. Right, this is the character who we know who stays indoors. She does not like being outdoors, and yet she travels for 400 miles. So this was really impressive for a student who went from zero to, I would say, you know, like pretty impressive, you know, over the course of the semester. Okay, um, I'm running out of time, so I should get through this very quickly. Um, for sustained mapping, I'm gonna just highlight, this was an independent project done by my student. It was extremely impressive. He got very into the minutia of Conrad, of Conrad's <coughs> diaries and Heart of Darkness. Um, if we can go to the next slide, actually. So you can see here too, he was able to chart green where Conrad stops, purple places mentioned in Heart of Darkness, and orange places Conrad may have stopped, but can't be confirmed as 100% accurate. And he made even little pins throughout all of ArcGIS that he, where he, in fact, found places by not, not by geographic location or even topographical detail, but in fact, by actually calculating. Marlowe says we walk for two hours. He was able to figure out where Marlowe went based off of we walk for two hours. That was, I mean, it was very impressive. But here's where I'm going to get to my last slide. Um, and I'm just going to say that for the cons, though, this leads me to the cons of this work, which was that he got so into the minutiae that we kind of lost sight of the big question. What is the critical intervention? What has this taught us about Heart of Darkness? And frustratingly, it taught us very little. Like, so we had an impressive map, um, but, but we weren't really sure what this told us about the novel. And so it seemed like the critical payoff was disproportionate to the amount of time spent on the work. Moreover. He had real frustration. There was an unclear future for this product. So like, where should we bring this map? What do we do with that now? Who is its audience? And so there was frustration about not having an immediate community for working on this project with. Um, so I would say then, for to take it, then all of this, all of this together, and take it to my lessons for the future, um, I think that the biggest payoff was in thinking, um, I'm, you guys can read my slides, so I'm going to just wrap up right now. 
But I would say that perhaps the biggest takeaway from all of this was that there needs to be more consideration of the afterlife of our maps, of our products, right, and what we're going to do with it. And interestingly for my student, the biggest payoff that he got was he was able to put on his resume, I led a class, a one hour long class, on mapping and my own personal research, which he now puts like in his internship applications and his job applications to say that he can work with the public. And he did it beautifully. I made him create a beautiful lesson plan to leave this class. Um, and it was, and that was how he had a built-in audience. So I think if I was to do this in the future, what I would suggest is take on independent study students prior to teaching your intro to DH course, and then make those students work as digital liaisons for the course. Actually put them in charge of the whole mapping section. Um, and because perhaps then that builds in the audience, right, for these independent projects that have very kind of like treacherous afterlives. Um, and, and it also gives them kind of like those hard skills that they're looking for um, that they can then transfer over to whatever their careers will be in the future.